Support for UWTV is provided by the Boeing Employees Credit Union. Well, I was certain that it was a tooth problem because that's what it felt like, like a, a abscess tooth or a root canal because I'd had several of those. And so that was the feeling and I thought the dentist was a logical place to go. Over a period of months, the pain just got progressively worse. He's the one that eventually took the biopsy and discovered what the real problem was. I said, and the results are, and he said, I'm so sorry that I'm not there to tell you this in person, but you have cancer. I was devastated. I tried not to show it outside too much this more. I held it inside. Hello, I'm Dr. Neil Futran, Professor of Otolaryngology and Director of Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Washington Medical Center. I'd like to welcome you to Talk Medicine. Today, our topic is the treatment of oral cancer. Joining us is Carolyn Coogan from Bend, Oregon, who underwent treatment for this condition. Carolyn, why don't you tell us uh, how you first noticed there was a problem in your mouth? Well, I first noticed that I had some numbness in my right chin, and that was in the month of January. And I just thought that it was going to go away, so I didn't do anything about it. And then the following month, I started having pain, and it started out mild and then progressively got worse. And I initially thought that everything was dental related, so I started going to several dentists and then several other specialists I was referred to and never getting any answers and never really finding out what was wrong. I had gone through uh, root canals and several other procedures. But you had another uh, personal friend who is a medical professional who did a little bit more investigation, is that correct? Yes, we went to a trip to Boise, Idaho, and we were just visiting. Actually, we were staying at our friend's house, and he is a dentist uh, who had actually done almost all of the work in my mouth for the previous 20 years that we had lived in Boise. And uh, my husband wanted me to say something to him about the problem I was having, but I didn't want to bother him because he'd been working all day and I didn't want to do it on his off time. And he picked up on what John was saying and he says, no, Carolyn, tell me what's going on. And so I explained it to him and I told him the number of doctors that I had been to and he said, something is not right. We need to get to the bottom of it. I want you to make an appointment in my office and uh, we're going to check and see what's going on. And so it was the following month, which by that time was July, that I actually got in to see him. And at the beginning he thought, again, that it was a dental problem. He thought that it possibly could be a couple of old root canals and crowns that I had. So he started uh, doing the necessary work on those teeth. And then by August, um, I had the new crowns and the root canals and still only a small relief pain and then after that I had a lot of swelling and by the next time that I saw him he did oral surgery and was very concerned about what he found during the oral surgery and, and he, d he did a biopsy at that time. He did a biopsy at that time sent off for the results and then uh, a couple of weeks later we got the results. And what was that call like? It was a very unusual call. Uh, I thought it was just a personal call 
and he uh, chatted with uh, John just for a moment, my husband, and then he immediately asked for me, which was unlike him, so I knew there was a problem of some sort. I just didn't know what. Then I asked him how his vacation was, and he quickly proceeded to say that he had the results of my biopsy. And I said, well, I've just forgotten about that. What were the results? And he said, Carolyn, I'm so sorry to not be able to tell you this in person, but you have cancer. And I looked at my husband, and then I, uh, I said, I've got cancer. And I said, well, what's my prognosis, Tom? And he said, well, that's not really my area of expertise. And when he said that, I knew that it was a real problem because he was my friend as well as being my doctor. And I know once you did get the diagnosis through your physician, you ultimately saw an oncologist in Bend, Oregon. Uh, what uh, happened at that point as far as treatment? Well, two days after I got the diagnosis, I was able to get into an oncologist who was new to Bend. Uh, unbeknownst to me, he had spent the previous 15 years uh, at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, so he had excellent credentials. And I was very fortunate to get him as a doctor. And he told me that, this, uh, that I was going to have to have chemo and that I was also going to have to have surgery. That I asked him about the surgery, if he could explain any part of it to me. He told me that it was going to be very disfiguring. Uh, there was no choice that that was just the way that the, the surgery was going to be, that it was a very dramatic surgery. He told me that the chemo was going to be very aggressive because for a person my age to have it was very rare and uh, they didn't even have a treatment. They had to use adolescent treatment. And my chemotherapy had to be administered uh, slow infusion 24 hours a day uh, for the period it took to get the medication into my system, which was anywhere from three to six days. And I know you went uh, through the chemotherapy and there was surgery uh, planned. Had you heard anything else about uh, the surgery uh, prior to coming to the University of Washington Medical Center? Well, I'd gone to another major medical treatment center in Portland and I had an appointment with, actually there were about three doctors there that, that spoke with me. I had a list of questions. Uh, that unfortunately didn't get answered very well. I didn't feel comfortable with the answers that I got and I left there feeling like I was not going to have the surgery. Then a friend told me about a fellow in Lodi, California who had had cancer in his jaw, had also been discovered by his dentist and he sent me a picture, uh, an email picture of himself three months after the surgery so that I would feel more comfortable that I wasn't most likely going to be as disfigured as what I had thought in my mind. And was that the time you found out about the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and the University of Washington Medical Center? It was pretty close in there. Um, I had friends in Boise, uh, my best friend actually, that was very concerned about my condition from the beginning and who had looked up online some of the best treatment centers in the Northwest. And she called me and she says, Carolyn, you've got to go to this website and you've got to contact these people. And even though I didn't feel like doing that, I went ahead and did it. And I got uh, a person on the telephone and they told me about what they did and they asked about my case and spent about an hour of time with me even though I wasn't even a patient. They wanted to know if I was looking for another opinion on the type of cancer that I had. And I said, no, I've, I've already had three opinions. I know I have the cancer. I need to get in contact with someone that can actually do the surgery. Can you refer me to someone that does that? And they referred me to your office. When you first came into the office, we, of course, reviewed your history and previous treatment. Uh, and then uh, examined you. And we can see on this uh, picture, this is uh, after uh, chemotherapy, we can see in the area of the molars there's some redness and some expansion of the bone, which is the central part of the tumor. When we look at your MRI, the left side is actually your right jaw, 
we can see in the molar area the increased area of whiteness which indicates the presence of residual tumor. With that, we talked about treatment options, surgery being an important part of the overall uh, treatment. If we're going to do surgery, we want to take out the entire tumor with a rim of normal tissue. And the way we do that for the jawbone can be seen here in this model. So the surgery involved a few things. We want to maintain the shape of the mandible, so we put a plate on before we take out the tumor. And that, then we actually re will remove a segment of the jawbone uh, that then needs to be replaced. And although there are different tissues we can use, we need bone and soft tissue with the blood supply. And we use the fibula bone, which is the smaller bone in your leg. And we take the middle portion of the bone with the soft tissue. And then we can go ahead, fashion it into a new jawbone, replace the tissue in the mouth, and hook up the little blood vessels so everything survives. Now this was actually on the opposite side of where my surgery was. Right, exactly. And how much of this bone of my leg did you actually take out? We actually can take as much as we need, but we usually take about uh, 10 inches or so in order to provide the reconstruction. We need to get exposure to that area, and there are a couple of ways we do it. One way is to actually come up through the chin and the lip and expose things. But obviously, if we can avoid an incision uh, in your face, we can do it from underneath the jaw and inside the mouth to get the same result. And for a lot of patients, it's a whole lot of information to process uh, when you're first visiting. And I'm kind of curious what you thought when we talked about these procedures. Well, it was pretty scary to begin with. Um, I like the fact that you gave me options on how it, the surgery could actually be done. Um, I was kind of concerned about having the cut down the chin because I, I thought of chewing and talking and so forth, but I wanted you to do the surgery the way that you thought would be the easiest for you to be able to get the tumor out of my body because I just wanted it gone and I was ready to proceed with the surgery. Well, as important as it is for the surgery to be successful, your overall being and maintaining continuity of care is equally as important throughout the hospital stay and subsequent treatment. An essential component of that is Carol Stimson, our head and neck nurse practitioner, who dedicates her time to the care of patients with head and neck tumors. Thank you for my introduction. And when you came to see Neil that first day, Carolyn, that was the first time I had a face-to-face -face encounter with you. Um, I believe I met you before you sat down and talked with Dr. Yes. Futran. And then we sat down afterward, and I wanted to make sure if you had any questions, so we were able to answer them for you and just give you a brief, brief introduction of who I was as a nurse practitioner, what I do, and also let you know uh, as much as you were able to take in that day what your hospital stay was going to be like. What kind of questions were you able to ask Carol that you didn't ask me? I believe that I asked you what the success rate was mm -hmm. with how most people got through the surgery. Mm -hmm. You were able to answer that and I asked uh, a number of questions I think about uh, the team of doctors and uh, basically what I should expect uh, as far as the hospital stay. Yeah, and that I'm actually able to, because I don't have as many time constraints, expound a little bit on what your hospital stay was going to be like and sort of define what each member of our team did, does. And uh, we have three residents that are in service all the time. They're very busy, so it's important that I'm able to spend the time with you to make sure I sort of demystify the process. Well, and it was nice to know that there was someone that I could ask. Obviously, I couldn't call Dr. Futran every time I had a question, but I knew I could contact you. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a really good feeling going in. And that's what I'm there for. Why don't we talk about uh, the surgery itself now? Uh, on this picture, this is actually an operative uh, picture where on the upper left corner is your ear, on the upper right is your nose and lips. And what we've done is we've made an incision in the neck and lifted up the tissue to expose the jaw and tumor. We put that plate on just like the model 
And then we go ahead and remove the tumor. So we have the gap in the jawbone and the exposure into the mouth. And then this is actually the tumor specimen removed. And now we can begin reconstruction by trying to hook up a nerve to help recreate some sensation in the area. This is a picture of the fibula bone with the soft tissue in the blood vessels. And we're able to make cuts in the bone to restore the normal shape of the jawbone. And then the tissue hanging underneath is rotated over the bar into the mouth so that we can recreate your gum and floor of mouth uh, tissue. Once that's done, after about uh, 10 or 12 hours of uh, surgery, uh, you end up in the intensive care unit. And I think we have a picture of you in the intensive care unit on that uh, first uh, post-operative day. Why don't you talk a little bit about that experience in your hospital stay? Well, I can remember the ICU nurse asking me how I felt, and I was complaining about my leg. I said, my leg hurts, because it was the most painful part. I, I didn't, couldn't feel too much around the facial area because the, the, the pain was so intense in the leg. And, and I somewhat knew that that was going to be the case because people had told me that, but until you experience it, you don't really know. At that point in time, I was able to actually see you awake after surgery, um, get a chance to see if you had any questions, see how you felt. Tried to explain the plethora of equipment we had you hooked up to all the drains and try to go over any questions that you may have had from surgery just to make sure we had a good understanding or you had a good understanding of what was going to happen for that day. And also introduce what's going to happen next as so you were going to go from the ICU to the regular hospital in a day or two. And over that uh, next week you spent with us, I know I saw you once or twice uh, every day, but clearly Carol and uh, the other personnel who help take care of patients has spent more uh, time with you. Why don't you tell us about how you recovered during the week, got up walking, swallowing, things like that? Well, I didn't have a problem swallowing. Um, the feeding tube was uncomfortable. That was probably more, more difficult than, than anything uh, as far as the eating portion. Um, I think that I recovered quite quickly, faster than I expected, you did very well. and I got up walking before I wanted to walk because that's what I had to do. But uh, I think that everything fell together much faster than I expected it to, knowing how delicate the surgery was. And Carolyn, you did very well during your hospital stay. You had a lot of great questions, which made my job a little bit easier. But you were able to follow along. We do have a plan. We have a basic kind of menu of what we want our patients to do from day to day and you naturally just fell into that. You were very ambitious in trying to get up every day and walk. We do have physical therapy and occupational therapy work with us during, our, you know, during your hospital stay to make sure you get up safely and able to walk and that you're progressing as we would expect you to. And we have great nurses on the floor and they're very much a part of our team as well and communicate with you and with me to make sure that we have all your questions answered. Yes. As we like to do these days, we want people out of the hospital as soon as they're healthy and able. And you transitioned uh, quite well uh, with the help of Carol and the staff uh, outside the hospital. And we have a photo that you took of yourself 10 days after surgery while you're still in Seattle. How is that transition back to uh, being outside the hospital? Actually, it went quite well. I was worried about being able to walk uh, okay, safely. Uh, I did fine. I took care of my incisions when I went back to see you the following week after I'd gotten out of the hospital. Uh, everything was okay, and so you released me to go out of, back out of state to my home. Right. And Carolyn and I, we got a chance to talk. You could call, which was what we'd want you to do with any questions, and I was your contact person along with the other nursing staff in our clinic to make sure we got your questions answered. But you did, you look great actually to me in that picture, and you did exceptionally well um, during your first days out of the hospital too. As uh, many patients require additional therapy, be it chemotherapy or radiation therapy or both, you needed some additional chemotherapy uh, back in Bend over the ensuing months. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how that uh, progressed? I had to wait until that I was healthy enough to actually start the chemo again, which took approximately uh, two months after I was out of the hospital. I was able to start my next 
three rounds of chemo. I stayed in contact with you mm -hmm. to let you know how I was doing so that you could talk, tell Dr. Putran mm -hmm. and keep you up to date. And finally, after eight months, after surgery and chemotherapy, we have a smiling uh, picture of you, so I think you're feeling pretty well. How did you feel about your speech swallowing and appearance at that time? Um, swallowing was fine. That was never an issue. The speech was uh, somewhat difficult. I just had to uh, realize that there were some words that I could, I had to say more slowly. Um, th my appearance was much better than I ever anticipated. Yeah, I think you've actually progressed really nicely. I had very little swelling after surgery, and you know, although it probably seemed much greater to you than it did yes, to us, it did. but you really have healed exceptionally well from your all your procedures. And there's one more uh, picture here about 14 months after surgery. It looks like you've grown uh, your hair back. But one of the most important things we wanted to accomplish in addition to getting rid of the cancer and reconstructing the jaw was to ultimately get teeth. Tell us about the process of moving on to getting uh, teeth back in that area of your jaw. Well, you referred me to Dr. Rubenstein in prosthodontics at the University of Washington Dental School who specializes in implant, implanted teeth and then also Dr. Worthington who actually does the surgery of the implants and I met with the two of them at one time and they explained the two options that I had. One was more invasive and I chose the less invasive procedure, but I waited to have surgery until about two years after I was actually cancer-free before I would start the procedure because I wanted to make sure that the cancer wasn't coming back, at least in the immediate future, before I decided to go into another surgery. And I know you recently saw Dr. Rubenstein uh, and uh, Dr. Worthington, and we have a video of that uh, meeting. Okay, there you go. Okay, now okay. let's see what's cooking here. Oh, that looks great. Karen, this is a model that Dr. Rubenstein has made of your jaw before we did our surgery. Here are the remaining teeth. This is the area where the original jawbone was removed and replaced by the little bone graft from the leg. And these teeth, if you remember, in the front were beginning to get a little bit loose. Those are the ones that we sacrificed in order to provide us with a solid piece of bone in the whole chin area where we could have longer, stronger implants placed. Each one has a hole in it and the inside of each hole has a thread so that the superstructure carrying the teeth can be screwed to these anchoring points and on the x-ray it looks like this. Here are your three strong, long implants in the chin with the superstructure made of metal screwed to those implants and the line of teeth lying on top of this metal framework. It looks like everything is solidly in place. How has it all worked out for you? Actually, it's excellent. Uh, the examination showed that nothing had loosened up uh, it's comfortable, I'm able to talk normally, and I can chew again. I can actually bite again, which I hadn't been able to do for a number of years. And so I'm completely satisfied with everything that's been done. How long has it been now since you've been cancer-free? Three years, two months, and a few odd days. And has that allowed you to resume the things you love to do in life? Pretty much, yes. I've learned that I'm much stronger than what I thought I was originally. I've learned to appreciate each day. I've learned to go ahead and do the things that I felt like I needed to wait, just to go ahead and make the plans and go enjoy. I'm enjoying more travel. We've gone across the country, we've been to Australia, we've been to Hawaii again, and. So that's probably one of the things I enjoy the most, and spending time with the family, and a lot of the simple things, just walking in the park or watching wildlife, uh, birds, I love birds, I love water, I love to go to the ocean, that's probably my favorite thing, going to the ocean, and um, 
the small things are probably the things that you find are most important after you've gone some, through something like this. Holding hands, hugging my kids, and holding my little dog. <laughs> Just waking up each day. Even if I don't do anything special, just waking up each day and being okay. I read something in a magazine at the doctor's office the other day that anyone who says that winning isn't everything has never had to fight cancer. And I thought that was very appropriate. And it's true. It is great to see you back enjoying the things you love. Do you have any last thoughts for patients who will undergo uh, treatment for oral cancer? So I guess the most important is for a patient to realize the strength that they have that they might not think that they have and to keep going and getting all the information that they can get. Ask questions and expect answers. To trust your doctors, you have to feel completely confident with them and knowing that they have your life in their hands and you have to surround yourself with the love of your family and friends and don't feel any less loved if your family sometimes acts as if they're not as in tune to what you're going through as you are because as my oncologist in Ben told me that sometimes denial is not a bad place to be for the family, but it doesn't mean that they don't love you just as much. And they just can't face the fact it's their way of handling it. And sometimes your friends do that too. It's their way of handling that you are facing such an issue. Carolyn, I just wanted to say that it's been wonderful to sit and talk with you today. You're a great patient to care for, and uh, you know, it's been, I have to say, it's been a privilege to be able to care for you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Carolyn, Carol, and you for joining us at Talk Medicine today. As with other cancers, early detection and treatment of oral cancer leads to the most successful outcome. I'm Dr. Neil Futran, and thanks for joining us.